Good evening. Thank you all for being here tonight. I appreciate your presence, but I also know the Lord appreciates your presence, your desire to come and be with the, your, the fellow saints, to uh, share with one another in these songs, to hear the prayers and have your minds directed by them, and hopefully to hear something from the Word of God that might be helpful to you. It's been a very quick week for me. I know that many of you have responsibilities during the day, and uh, it's a tiring week for you because of either working or during the day or having uh, a lot of things to do and then coming in the evenings. And I appreciate very much. The attendance has been very good. The interest has been even better. You uh, have made Sandy and I feel very much at home. Uh, we are originally from Ohio, by the way, if you didn't know that. We uh, grew up in the Akron area. And yet, uh, her family's from West Virginia, and mine's from the Marietta area, so uh, we have a lot in common with some of the folks here. Uh, I appreciate very much uh, the hospitality we've been given, starting with the, uh, the potluck on Sunday, and then on Monday being with, uh, with Marsha and Eddie, on Tuesday with Lynn and Linda, and today with Jeremy and uh, Christina. And it's just been a wonderful time. You've showered great blessings upon us in many ways, and we're very grateful for that. And it's also been good to, uh, not I was going to say get reacquainted. We don't need to be reacquainted with Mike and Pam. We've been friends for 40 years, and though we are now just almost a 1,000 miles apart, Whenever we get together, we just pick up right where uh, we left off. And they've been very gracious to us, and it's been a joy to us to be able to spend that time in uh, in their home. And uh, Pam's probably expecting me to say something snarky about her, but uh, I'm going to refrain from that and uh, try to keep a little bit of dignity here in the pulpit. But it's it's been wonderful for me, and I very much appreciate the way you receive the lessons that I've presented. Uh, in selecting those lessons, I tried to pick those that I thought might be very helpful to all of us. And as someone noted, uh, so many of the lessons, as a matter of fact, in all the lessons, deal with love. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. The Bible places upon us, and I hate to say the responsibility but the opportunity to be those who love as God loves. The very Bible itself is based upon the principle of loving God with all your heart, loving your neighbor as yourself. And I appreciate very much the songs that Tim selected that are going to, to talk about love. And it's interesting. While in the upper room with his disciples, just prior to being arrested, just prior to experiencing those illegal trials and ultimately his crucifixion, Jesus gave these men with whom he had spent about three years a new commandment. In John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, he said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This, is, to me, is a very important passage. I realize all Scripture is important. God has preserved it for us so that we might have access to it. But yet, as we look to this particular passage here, these two verses, Jesus is telling those men who are in that upper room with him that they are to love as he loves. That's what makes this commandment new. And notice, he said, you need to do this, not only to love one another for the sake of love, but by this all men will know you are my disciples. You know, sometimes, and I can't speak for, for you, I don't know personally and intimately a lot of folks in this congregation, but I know places that I've gone and even in our congregation back home. Sometimes folks aren't characterized by love, and certainly not the kind of love that Jesus has. If we are going to impress the world, if we are going to be lights in the world, we have to have the kind of love that Jesus wants us to have. 
And notice he said, by this all men will know you are my disciples. There's something distinct about this. There's something unique about this. And it's something that we need to be concerned about. Not just those men who were with him at that time, but each one of us who claim to wear his name. We need to love as he loves. But if we're going to obey this commandment, we must know how Jesus loved. And therefore, the only way we can truly know that is to go to the Scriptures. Because it is the Scriptures that reveal him to us. Reveal his character, his qualities, his traits that allowed him to live in the manner in which he did. To be that loving individual that he was and that he continues to be. We are to grow into the image of Jesus Christ. We are to be partakers of the divine image. And if we're going to do that, we must love as Jesus loved. But to find out how he loved, I really don't believe you need to look any farther than the same chapter that we've been looking to, John chapter 13. And look to Jesus' actions in that upper room. Because they displayed not only to those men, but to us also, how Jesus loved. And that's what we're going to look at in our lesson this evening. Read with me John chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. Now before the peace of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. As supper being ended, the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. So Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. As we look to the idea of loving as Jesus loved, we can look to this passage of Scripture that I've just read to you and see the traits of the love of Jesus. And the first one that we consider is if we're going to love as Jesus loved, we need to humble ourselves before others. As Lord and teacher, his disciples should have washed his feet. But Jesus humbly reversed roles. You can probably imagine that washing the feet of those disciples was not a most pleasant task. Everywhere they went, they walked. And back then, they didn't have concrete sidewalks to walk upon. They were walking in sand and dirt. They were wearing sandals, and you can imagine what their feet must have been like. When my boys were teenagers, and they'd take off those Nike shoes and the smell of those socks. Oh, my. Put your shoes back on. We're trying to eat here, you know. Jesus wash the filthy feet of his disciples. 
This was a task that was given to the lowest servant in the house. It was not something that the chief steward would do. It was something that the lowest servant was assigned to wash the feet of the visitors who would come. And Jesus should have, instead of washing his disciples' feet, they should have washed his. But humility is to be a characteristic of the follower of Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. Therefore, the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, right in the midst of all these things that we are to put on, qualities that we are to have as children of God, as disciples of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, by inspiration, says, we need to put on humility. Sometimes that's a problem for those who claim to be Christians. Sometimes it's a problem for preachers that they start getting their ego boosted by such comments as you've given me this week. It would be easy to allow it go to your head, but to remember you are a humble servant. Each and every one of us is but a humble servant. Look at Titus chapter 3 and verse 2. Paul telling the young evangelist to remind those to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable gentlemen, showing all humility to all men. All humility to all men. By this, all men shall know you are my disciples. How do we conduct ourselves before those out in the world? Do they recognize us as being humble? As being willing to serve them? To defer to them? Do our brethren even recognize that? We need to show all humility to all men. This was a quality of Jesus. He was Lord and teacher or rabbi. But look at what he did in service to others. Such humility should cause one not to only submit to God, but also to one another. 1 Peter 5 and verse 5, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you, be submissive to one another. Be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We are to submit to one another, defer to one another, esteem one another better than self. We had a lectureship in the the spring, and uh, we were talking about the epistles of Peter. And when we came to 1 Peter 5 and verse 5, the, or 1 Peter chapter 5, I should say, the lesson that we had was be clothed with humility. Well, the preacher who we assigned that task got up, and while he was preaching, took out from under the lectern an apron, put it over his head, tied it around his waist, and on the front of it it said, Humility. We need to think of that. We need to be clothed with humility. It's that which we, that should adorn us every day. Not arrogant. Not those individuals who look down upon others, but who esteem others better than self. And if we are humble individuals, we'll love as Jesus loved, because loving as Jesus loved involves serving others. You've served us very graciously this week, and we're very grateful for it. But I hope you serve one another in that same fashion. Consider verses 14 and 15 of our text. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do as I have done. What has he done? Yes, he washed his feet. And there's some people who literally take it for granted that this text is telling that we ought to have a service where foot washing is done. That isn't what Jesus was teaching at all. What Jesus was teaching is humility, serving one another. As I have served you, you need to serve one another. Jesus came to this earth to be a servant. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 5, 6, and 7. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, 
but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. A bondservant. Jesus came as a servant. He came to serve. And he served even those who wouldn't appreciate it. He humbled himself. Came in the form of man, in the form of servant, to serve other people. Matthew 20 and 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's our Savior. That's the way our Savior loves. That's in coming to this earth. He came with that idea that he was going to be of service to mankind, and he performed the greatest service ever given to mankind. His sacrificial death on the cross, his life a ransom for many, that gave hopeless man hope of having his sins forgiven or remitted, taken away, being able to have a relationship once again with God and have the hope of life eternal. The Christian is a servant who is to serve. I talked the other day about how we are created in Christ Jesus for good works in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. But look at these men who carried the message of Jesus to the world. As we look to the words that they have written by inspiration, Paul, James, Peter, and Jude, in their epistles, all referred to themselves as bondservants, just as Jesus was a bondservant. They were that understanding of how lowly and how humble they needed to be. And as Christians, to properly love God and one another, we must develop a servant mentality. One of our brethren, Tim Jennings, wrote a song that's called The Servant Song. And it starts out, make me a servant. And it ends up, just like your son. We need to be serving one another. We need to be serving the Lord. Matthew chapter 25. We often talk about the judgment and the things that will take place along that day. And we'll be judged by the things that we've done in the body, we're told, whether good or bad. But Jesus depicts the judgment in Matthew chapter 25. And notice what he says. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He will set the sheep on his right hand, the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Do you notice how much of that is related to serving? Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. I want you to stop and think of the person that may be a member of this congregation or some that one that is visited from time to time or someone that's claimed to be a Christian from your past. And I want you to think of the weakest Christian you've ever known. That's the least of these, my brethren. And I am to be of service to that individual. I'm to be a source of encouragement to them. I'm to be a source possibly of correction to them. That's helping them. That's serving them. But sometimes we're only concerned about those who are strong in the faith. And we identify with them and we associate with them. And we allow those who, those of us who are preachers called of being on the fringe, get no real consideration. And those are the ones who need it the most. If we're going to hear 
enter in to the joys of the Lord. Enter into the kingdom prepared for you. We need to be people who are servants. Loving as Jesus loves means to quit competing. Competition is something that is ingrained in us, especially as Americans. Our children compete in sports so they can gain victories that way and triumph over others. Businesses compete with one another for profits, for customers, patrons. I want to tell you, folks, there is no place for competition in the Lord's kingdom. Jesus' washing of his disciples' feet may have been in response to their rivalry at the table. Did you realize what these disciples were doing? This was the very last time they were going to sit down with Jesus while he was living before the cross. And yet, while he is there talking to them, giving them this demonstration, Luke's account of it said in Luke 22, verse 24, Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. How the very opposite of what Jesus did. But this competition had been an ongoing problem. In Mark, the ninth chapter, verse 33, he, he, Jesus, came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent. For on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. If you're looking for preeminence among God's people, if you're looking to greatness and have others recognize you as just being this stellar Christian in so many ways, and that's your thought, that's your motive in serving. I've got a name for you. It's Diotrephes. These men were competing to see which one could be the greatest. Remember, the mother of James and John came to Jesus and said, When you come in your kingdom, would you let one of my boys sit on your right, right hand and the other on your left hand? Those were the most prominent, most powerful positions in a kingdom. And the other disciples got upset because they wanted those positions for themselves. And this attitude and rivalry needed to be addressed, for it is carnal. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning verse 1, Paul wrote, I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you're still not able, for you are still carnal. Where there is envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Anytime we see these things in a congregation, there's carnality there. There's worldliness there. And we need to do like Barney Fife, nip it, nip it in the bud. For such competition is the very opposite of what Christ desires of his followers. And it has no place in his kingdom. Now there was also a dispute among them, as I read earlier from Luke 22, as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. What's Jesus saying in reality? The younger. I can remember when I was growing up, sometimes in our society things have changed a little bit. When we had a family dinner and all the extended family got together. It wasn't the kids that were served first. It was the adults. And the kids waited. And they had their own little table that they sat at in the kitchen and the rest of the family was in the dining room. The younger were respecting the older and serving them. He who governs is he who serves. I've been an elder in the church for 25 years. Somebody said, well, it's a position of honor. In a way, it is. 
but in reality, it's a position of service. And you are blessed that you have two elders who serve you and have that attitude of heart to do what's best for the congregation, to, be, to do what's best for each individual who comprises this congregation. And that's because of this attitude. Not to seek notoriety, not to seek preeminence, but to just serve and be the one who is servant of all. Christians are to esteem others better than self, to give preference to one another as recited from Philippians 2. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also the interests of others. We live in a society where the emphasis is on me. I'm part of the baby boom generation. And back in the 90s, well, really the 80s and 90s, they don't do it so much anymore. But they called us the me generation because everything was about me. (laughs) Everything was aimed toward me. We can't have that attitude as children of God. We need to think of others. Romans 12 and verse 10, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another. Do I do that? Do I think of others before I think of self? Loving as Jesus loves means to correct one another in love. It was out of love for those disciples, I believe, that Jesus addressed their problem. If a Christian truly loves, he'll be concerned when he sees a brother or sister who is faltering. Instead of saying something like, well, I knew they were no good. I I knew they wouldn't last. Oh, they're just so weak. Their mind's on other things. And we just want to write them off. If we love as Jesus loves, we can't do that. Parents who properly love their children will correct them as needed. And Christians are to encourage the weak, seek to restore the fallen. Galatians 6 and verse 1, Brethren, if any man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. That's that humility coming back again. And notice he said, you who are spiritual. Does that mean if I don't have this attitude of heart about me, if I'm not willing to help that person who has overtaken that sin or trespass, am I truly spiritual? I must ask myself that. James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Brethren, if anyone among you wonders from the truth and someone turns it back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Sometimes we, and I'm using that editorially, we place so much emphasis on getting people to Christ by baptism. And we should. But at the same time, let us not neglect those who have been baptized and need our help and need our, the strength that we can provide them. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, one of the reasons we come together is to encourage one another. <coughs> And to love and good works. To watch out for one another. To care for one another. To see those who are weak. And to help them. And strengthen them. To build them up. To edify them. Loving as Jesus loved. Means letting others love us. Now that might sound a little bit selfish. But understand what I mean by this. Peter, at first, refused to allow Jesus to wash his feet. Did you ever wonder why Peter was last? Normally, we might think he should be first. Because he was the one that Jesus in Caesarea Philippi said, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom. And Peter was the one who preached the gospel in its fullness for the very first time on that day of Pentecost, recorded for us in Acts chapter 2. Peter always seemed to be a leader among the disciples. But why did Jesus go to him last? In the configuration that they were in, 
It wasn't a table like we think of. It was actually a U-shaped table, okay? And at the top of the table was the host, and that would have been Jesus. On one hand was the most prominent guest. That was the disciple whom Jesus loved, John. On the other hand, here, was Judas. If you went around the table, the lowest individual would be at the bottom of that leg of the table, the very last one to be served. Peter was in that position at this table. And he realized that what Jesus was doing was a task that only was given to the lowliest servant in the house. Maybe he thought it was a test to see how he would act or react. And that by refusing Jesus' actions, he would pass that test with flying colors. Oh, you're the Lord. You're the teacher. You're the rabbi. But if that's what he thought, he was wrong. He had refused Jesus. There are times as Christians, we need to allow others to serve us. One time we had a family where the husband had lost his job. Times were tough. And so a bunch of brethren got together. They bought, went to the, the stores and bought groceries and other things that were needed gathered some money together and uh, wanted to help this family, filled their tank with gasoline. The woman came out and was angry. She said, why are you doing this for us? This is something you do to, to other people. And she mentioned two or three people that she thought she was better than. She refused. The help that we wanted to give. Bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. Those burdens may be financial. They may be physical. They may be spiritual. They may be emotional. They may even be intellectual. But we are to bear one another's burdens. And we are to allow others to bear our burdens. To love as Jesus loved is to love unconditionally. I want you to just for a moment stop and think of the men whose feet Jesus washed. Well, first of all, they were arguing about which one of them would be greatest. Their mind was not on what Jesus was doing, what he was saying. But consider this. Every one of them would soon abandon him. At his arrest, they all fled. One would betray him with that kiss in the garden. One would deny him, not once, but three times. These were the men whose feet Jesus washed. And my friends, Jesus knew exactly what they were going to do. He knew that Satan had placed in Judas' heart to betray him. He knew that Peter was going to deny him three times before the cock crew. He knew all those things. Yet, he stooped and washed their feet. You know what that lets me know? We do not have the right to pick and choose among brethren as to whom we will love or not love. This very Apostle Peter told us, in love of the brethren, be tenderly affectionate one to another. I don't have the right to just pick out a few that I'm going to love. I must love my brethren. 
I must esteem my brethren better than self. I must love as Jesus loved, for he loved unconditionally. He manifested his love toward all of these men in spite of their failures, in spite of their leaving him. And as we bring our lesson to a close, some questions. Do your brethren know that you love them as Christ loves? Do they see that in you? Do you show that affection? Do you show that care? Do you show that compassion and mercy? Do you look out for them? Do you look after them? Do you serve them? Even the least of his brethren. Are you humbly serving them? Preferring them? Lovingly correcting them when they need it? Are you allowing them to love you? Or do you keep them from loving you? Keeping them at arm's distance? I've been in Tallahassee, Florida with the same congregation for 35 years. There are some folks there that have been there just as long as I have. And to tell you the truth, I really don't know them because they won't let me. They keep us at arm's distance. Some of those folks, are, in essence, I've known or at least been acquainted with for 35 years. I've never been in their home. We invite them to come to our home and they won't come. What does that say about them? Are they loving as Christ loves? Are they seeking out the affection of their brethren? Are they giving any affection to their brethren? You know, we've got some that come in late, leave early. (laughs) There have been times when I've gotten done with the invitation, and I know they leave at the end of the invitation. I almost run to the back of the building and run across the parking lot, and sometimes I feel like tackling them. And they claim to be those who love Christ and love their brother. Greatness in the kingdom and the salvation of the soul comes by loving and serving as Christ loves and serves. And if you don't take anything else away from the meeting we've had together these past few days, Please remember this, because it is so vitally important to your spiritual well-being. I said earlier in the week, you can't have a proper relationship with God unless you have a proper relationship and attitude towards your brethren. And that's what Jesus is teaching. By this all men will know you are my disciples, if you love one another as I have loved you. Do you love your brethren as Jesus loves them? Are you willing to serve them? Are you willing to share with them your life as you share with the Lord? It's so important. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, we are told that God is love. Does it say that God is a loving God? Does it say that God loves certain people? It says God is love. When we love as we should, we are more like God than at any other time. And we take on his qualities, the qualities of his son, and the qualities that we are to have as followers of Jesus Christ. And if I don't have that kind of love, I'm in a sad state. Because my salvation depends upon it. Is it always easy to love your brethren? No. (laughs) I understand that. Some can be, as my dad used to say, pretty contrary. Hard to get along with. May not appreciate you. Preachers know that all too well. But look at Jesus. 
His love was such that even those who despised Him, He still loved. Do you love Him enough tonight to come to Him if you have not been found in Him before? Tim has selected the song, Being Born Again. Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews, came to Jesus. Wanted to know what he needed to do to have eternal life, in essence. And Jesus told him, he must be born of water and the Spirit in order to see the kingdom of God. Water, that watery grave of baptism in the likeness of Christ's death. Spirit, being directed by the Spirit-given word to do those things that Christ would have you to do to be found in him. That's all we're offering tonight. That's all we can offer. Because it's his gospel that is the power unto your salvation. And he is the one who loves you and died for you. Or if you claim to be his follower. And uh, you haven't been loving as you should. I hope this lesson will cause you to think. Cause you to draw closer not only to God, but to your brothers and sisters in Christ. And if we can say a prayer or the elders can say a prayer to help you do that, we stand ready to do that also. Should you need to come to Jesus Christ tonight, why don't you come on a stand?